Hi, welcome to the Stanford Digital Academy lunch uh, seminar. Uh, I'm Eric Rielsen, and today's seminar speaker is Stuart Russell. Uh, Stuart, uh, Stuart is, is the Smith Zada professor, professor of engineering, engineering at, UC at UC Berkeley, Berkeley and former chair of electrical engineering, engineering computer science department, department there. there. He was the vice chair of the World Economic Forum's Council on AI and Robotics. Are you going next month? Or? I am. You yes. are? Okay. And uh, author of the groundbreaking book, uh, Human Compatible, along with uh, Peter Norvig here. He was, uh, here he is, the co-author of the leading textbook of AI. Uh, his research covers a wide range of topics in AI, including machine learning, probabilistic reasoning, knowledge representation, planning, real-time decision-making. Actually, there's a lot longer more on the list. I'm just going to stop there. Um, uh, his current concerns include the threat of autonomous weapons and long-term future of AI and its relation to humanity, which is what we're going to be hearing about today. Um, we welcome and encourage questions during the seminar. If you're in the Zoom audience, please submit your questions using that Q&A function there in Zoom. And for those of you who are here in person, um, just raise your hand. And when I call on you to ask a question, you can speak up and I may repeat the question for the folks on Zoom. So Stuart, uh, welcome to Stanford. Please tell us what could happen if we succeed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric, for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to be back at Stanford in real life. Um, OK, so the click has stopped working. OK. <laughs> It's not clicking. Oh, there it goes. Let's try that again. Yes, good. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Um, um, so I want, I want first, of all, first of all get everyone, get everyone on the same page, page about what, what we're talking, talking about. about. What is what AI? Is AI? Uh, uh, obviously, obviously, it's, it's making, making intelligent, intelligent machines. machines. Um, and, and the conceptual, conceptual framework, framework in which AI has done, done its work since the beginning, beginning um, which Peter and I sort of instantiated in our textbook um, borrows a lot from economic notions and philosophical notions of rational decision making. Machines are intelligent to the extent that their actions can be expected to achieve their objectives. Um, and you can trace this back to Aristotle and lots of other places uh, in, in different traditions. Um, and within AI, there are lots of different subfields. Um, machine learning is on the bottom but it kind of underpins a lot of what's going on in the last decade or so. Um, but uh, there are lots of other kinds of AI besides machine learning. So uh, the earliest successful branch, I would say, was problem solving, uh, constraint satisfaction in games. So uh, chess programs and uh, checker playing programs and so on date back to the 1950s. Um, logical reasoning systems uh, to the 1960s, uh, producing things like planning technology. Do with the echo. Okay. Okay. Is that okay. Okay. Um, if anyone's looking at it and zooming here, you might want to make sure your, your mic is muted. Yeah. So what people are really doing, now I've lost the clicker again. What people are really doing uh, is working towards the long-term goal of the field, which has always been general purpose AI. Uh, so systems that can quickly learn to do basically anything that human beings can do, uh, and probably more, right? Because of their enormous advantages in memory and processing speed and bandwidth, uh, if machines can do what we can do, they're probably going to be able to do uh, a lot more things and, and, and do them a lot better than we can. Um, so that's the goal of the field, just as you know, the goal of cancer research is to cure cancer. This is the goal of AI research. Um, and uh, a few years ago, I started thinking about what happens if we succeed. So there's actually a section, even in the first edition of the textbook, uh, called What If We Do Succeed? 
uh, which sounds a little bit insecure because <laughs> sort of implies that maybe we, we aren't succeeding. But um, the uh, the answer to that question isn't something that we think about very much in AI, um, partly because the field is so difficult um, that we just scrabble away at the rock face trying to uh, trying to make some progress. And um, but if you think about what would general purpose AI mean, uh, you know, one of the things you could do with it um, would be to do what human beings can already do, right? Which is provide each other with a decent standard of living. Kind of think about like Palo Alto standard of living, <laughs> if you like. Uh, and um, but do that for everyone. And we could do it for everyone because uh, with general purpose AI, you're not paying expensive people uh, to do all those things. And so um, if you just do a quick net present value calculation, it's about $13.5 quadrillion if we had that. Um, so that's a lot of money, right? It, it makes... I'm here. Yeah. We need to mute it. Oh, you want to mute yeah. it there? Okay, yeah. it said, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll mute it too. Okay. We're streaming the audio. Um, so it makes, you know, if you look, if you think of that as the sort of cash prize for whoever invents general purpose AI, that's obviously an oversimplification, but that's sort of the order of magnitude of what we're looking at. Um, and so these, you know, billion, 10 billion, 100 billion dollar investments that people are talking about from China and the EU and the US, um, they are still negligible in comparison. Um, and I think as we start, you know, as things start to become more plausible that this is really going to work, I think we'll see a huge acceleration uh, in those investments. So we could also do, oh, every time I have to go and touch it again, we can also do more things, right, things that we don't already know how to do. Um, so we could have much better individualized healthcare, we could have personal tutoring that would, you know, bring most kids to <clears throat> to college level by the time they were 10 or 11 years old um, and we could accelerate our, our rate of uh, scientific advance uh, considerably and i think we're already starting to see that in some disciplines where um, we're starting to figure out how uh, ai and physics go together ai and biology go together uh, to really make progress um, i think it's also true that Sorry about that. What happened here? Okay. Uh, it's also true that if we had general purpose AI today, uh, there would be enormous economic disruption because uh, very quickly people would start using it instead of human beings. Um, and we would have a very probably unpleasant. Uh, transition where large numbers of people would be unemployed. And I think so far that hasn't happened. And I know Eric and Andy and you, you talk about the great hollowing out. So I think it's been this sort of slow incremental process of, of gradually eliminating a lot of clerical work, a lot of the, <clears throat> the sort of lower half of white collar work um, and creating uh, much more insecure kinds of employment. And, um, but we might see big uh, increments when, for example, if we have uh, full warehouse automation, right? You think about all those Amazon warehouses, they have about a million people now, I think, working in those warehouses, just operating as robots, right? All they have to do is look at the order, pick the thing out of the box that the robot has already brought them, uh, and then send it off to the dis dispatch. So it's a purely robotic task, that's just this close from being automated. Um, and I think, you know, people talk about truck drivers and taxi drivers in the same, in the same vein. So we might see some big chunks of automation happening fairly soon. So when Turing talked about this, um, you know, we're, we're familiar with Turing from the paper where he talked about what we now describe as the Turing test uh, and dismissing a lot of challenges to the possibility of AI. But in 1951, he gave a talk, actually two talks, 
uh, one on the radio, one to a learned society in Manchester called the 51 Club. And this is a quote from that talk. It seems horrible that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Uh, and he doesn't offer any solution, any mitigation, or even any apology. It's just like, well, <laughs> there it is. There it is. Um, and so the, that's two pretty radical, radically different visions of what happens if we succeed. And um, so it's important to try to understand uh, why Turing said this, right? Why is it that making AI better and better makes things worse and worse? Right? And that's what I'm going to try to talk, try to answer to that question today. So if you fast forward, right, we now are starting to see uh, some of the dreams come true. So John McCarthy, uh, you know, his dream was always that uh, an, an AI driver would be able to take him to San Francisco airport. Uh, so he didn't have to do that drive anymore in park because he was fed up with it. Um, and uh, I don't think he lived long enough to see it, um, but uh, it's, it's certainly quite possible today. And we saw um, something that was predicted to take another hundred years uh, when Kasparov lost to Deep Blue in 97. Uh, you know, some experts said it'll be another hundred years before AI systems can defeat human Go champions, but it was only 20 years. Um, and, you know, when I, when I look at this, I mean, I, I play a little bit of Go, um, not very well, but what's astonishing to me about this is not how well AlphaGo plays or AlphaZero now, how well it plays when it's turned on full, right? Yes, it can wipe the floor with all human beings. It's when you turn it almost completely off, when you turn off search altogether, and it's only allowed to just look at the different possible moves and immediately evaluate the next state. So it's not looking ahead at all beyond one move. It's still able to play at a professional level. That to me is completely astonishing and in, in, incomprehensible. Uh, how, the patterns just from the patterns and, and say, yeah, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. So really, uh, it's un, uncanny. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to mention some work from, from my group, uh, not using deep learning, but actually using uh, logic and probability. This is the monitoring system for the nuclear test ban treaty. Uh, it's running in Vienna, so NetVisa is the name of the system. And this is a satellite photo from North Korea uh, showing, uh, this is the real-time detection that NetVisa produced. These are the probability contours for where we, where we think the event took place. Um, and uh, this was a nuclear explosion. And two days later, the assembled geophysicists uh, decided that it was up there. Um, they, they poured over all the records. They did lots of analysis. And that was their best estimate. And then on, on more detailed images, they found uh, the tunnel entrance to the testing facility over here. So, um, so NetVisa is now running 24-7 in Vienna and has more than, more than doubled the uh, sensitivity and accuracy of uh, uh, nuclear monitoring systems. And then there are things that we're doing with AI that we really shouldn't be doing. Um, and I just feel like I need to mention uh, autonomous weapons. And um, these are now a reality. So this is not terminators that exist in some science fiction world, right? You can buy these. Uh, and you can use them to kill people, as and this has already happened. Um, and the drawback for, the, for, uh, for this kind of use of AI is that when you take the human out of the loop, um, as happens with all kinds of computer systems, um, then you can sort of just use a loop. You can say, for i equals 1 to a million, do. Right? And you can send a million weapons to kill a million people. Or five million people or however many they can kill. Um, and so you create a weapon of mass destruction uh, that's actually much more uh, useful than nuclear weapons because it doesn't 
create massive clouds of radiation. Uh, you can kill just the people you want to kill. Uh, and it's a lot cheaper and easier to develop. Um, and so this is, this is the future that we're heading into. Well, it's worth noting you, you did a video of this, and those who haven't seen it, the Slaughterbot video that you did with uh, the Future of Life Institute that described this possibility. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we, ma we made the video to try to explain to policymakers what we were talking about, because apparently PowerPoint explanations weren't good enough. Uh, and they kept thinking we were talking about Terminators and Skynet. So we had to make a video to, to make the point very clear that we're just we're talking about multiplication, uh, and that's all. Right. So if you Google Slaughterbot, <laughs> you'll you'll see that video. It's like what a five seven minute video. Seven minutes. Yep. And um, yeah, I, I actually I presented it at the National Academies and. They said, you, sh you should have provided a volume warning. <laughs> uh, there are some questions. I don't know if you want to take the sort of a clarifying question sure, sure. now. Or, okay. I mean, just, you know. yeah. So um, Kai Nugent uh, asks, um, are there any general purpose AI so you mentioned several different AI systems here. But are there any general, AI general purpose AI systems being developed? As far as I know, machine learning algorithms are designed to solve specific tasks. Uh, deep learning, CNN, RNNs, and the current trend, if I'm correct, is to build specific models for specific problems. So how about for more? Well, um, I, I mean, there are not really general purpose AI systems in existence, but certainly if you look at what OpenAI is trying to do, um, and you look at the, uh, the Stanford Foundation Models Project is studying mm -hmm. those kinds of artifacts, they are intended to be as general as possible. And people are finding all kinds of ways, you know, they're officially language models, but you can, uh, you can combine it with vision and, and produce cartoons and animations, um, you can do all kinds of stuff, you can do arithmetic, um, you can write poetry, uh, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So they, they seem to exhibit some kinds of generality. But um, I would say, Roughly speaking, they can't plan their way out of a paper bag, mm -hmm. uh, so they're not uh, they're not general purpose AI in in that sense. But um, I think there's there's a, a misunderstanding of what it means to work on on a particular application. So let me give you an example. When Jan LeCun and his team at Bell Labs were working on handwritten digit recognition, right? They didn't produce a handwritten digit recognizer. They produce convolutional neural networks, mm -hmm. which happen to be useful for handwritten digit recognition, but also turn, turned out to solve the general object recognition problem uh, for computer vision and a few other things as well, and useful for speech too. Um, so this is, this is true almost all the time, right? We, when people were working on chess, they weren't working on chess programs. And, AlphaGo isn't a Go program, right? It's a general technique that's instantiated for that particular thing. But in order to make it work, they had to improve the state of the art of general techniques. And they use AlphaZero now to beat all sorts of different kinds of Yeah, games. so AlphaZero was, was demonstrated to, to be Even the world's chess. best <laughs> chess player, yeah. the world's best Go player, the world's best Shogi player, um, and so on. So, you know, what, what is AlphaZero not good at? Well, AlphaZero, requires the board to be fully observable, right? which, is, which is a very general thing. It's not, nothing to do with chess or Go. It's just a, to do with whether you have direct access to the state of the world or not. Right? And so if you want to make it more general, you've got to relax that restriction. When you do relax that restriction, right, then it covers all kinds of stuff, including driving and uh, you know, robot factory operations and you name it. So, so these advances, uh, even though they're made in the context of working on a particular application, end up massively in increasing the scope of AI. Okay. Um, so having said that, and this is a good, yeah, good follow on to the question, uh, we don't have it yet. And there are, there are big pieces still missing. Um, I think the biggest one is is long range thinking at multiple levels of abstraction. So if you take alpha zero, right, and it's, it's incredibly good at looking into the future in, in the game of Go, 
It looks ahead 60, 80 moves sometimes, far more than people can do. But if you took that same thing, that same approach, and you put it in a robot that has to send motor control commands to its motors every millisecond, then 80, 80 moves doesn't even get you a tenth of a second into the future. So for doing something like laying the table for dinner, it's completely useless, right? Uh, and so how do people lay the table for dinner? Well, they, I mean, they still, we still have to send motor control commands to our muscles every few milliseconds. Um, and yet we're able to do these things that take tens of millions or hundreds of millions or even trillions of low level actions. Like doing a PhD is about a trillion <laughs> low level actions, right? Uh, and yet we managed to do them and we managed to decide to do them or decide not to do them, right? Uh, because we operate at many, many, many levels of abstraction. And um, we don't yet know how to make AI systems that function in this way, that, that can create these levels of abstraction, that can seamlessly uh, execute at all these levels at the same time. Uh, you know, and it's amazing that the human body always has the low level stuff ready to go somehow. Right? That, that the high level stuff is feeding things down to the low level so that it always is doing the stuff. It's just amazing. Um, anyway, so these things are very unpredictable, right? These are, these are breakthroughs. Um, you know, we've had, some people would argue, a few dozen breakthroughs in AI since the beginning of the field, um, but we need more. And it's very hard to predict. And John McCarthy, he was asked in, I think, 77, how long do you think it'll take before we have human level AI? And he said, anywhere from five to 500 years. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, that's, that's still about, uh, about where we are, except we are, we are clearly further on. So I'd say maybe five to 100 years, I think would be a, a more reasonable. Assumption. There's a, a website called Metaculus that has a lot of predictions of mm -hmm. different experts. And, and one of them is when will we have um, weak AGI, which they didn't define in some detail about doing certain things. And uh, it's interesting because, um, uh, Two weeks ago, the date was 2043, and then uh, last week it dropped down to 2034 was the expert prediction. Perhaps <laughs> Dali and some of the other. Yeah, things. yeah, I've seen people get excited about Dali, and, and I have to say, I look at it and I don't, I don't. You're not as excited? Well, no, actually, I'm like puzzled. Like, how is it doing that? Oh, you are very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Would you, have you updated your, your estimate? Uh, I think a little, yeah. Yeah. A little, a little makes me a little uneasy. Um, yeah. So this unpredictability, right, is, is something that we've seen before, right? So the last time we invented civilization ending technology uh, was with atomic energy and the physics establishment, right? So from E equals MC squared in 1905 onwards, right? They knew how much energy there was stored in atoms and they could, you know, they could even describe the potential explosive power of an atomic weapon. Um, but the physics establishment continued to say that it was impossible. Um, and Lord Rutherford, who was the, you know, the guy who split the atom, um, <clears throat> he was asked, do you think, you know, in, even in 25 or 30 years, we might be able to liberate atomic energy? And he said, moonshine, right? Nonsense, <laughs> completely impossible. Right? Even Einstein uh, thought it was impossible. Um, and then uh, Leo Zillard read about Rutherford's speech in the Times the next morning and went for a walk and invented the new neutron induced nuclear chain reaction. I like the dates on that. Right? So, um, so these things are really hard to predict. I think, fortunately, we probably need more than one such breakthrough to reach general purpose AI. Um, but uh, to bet against these kinds of breakthroughs, and, and in fact, it was because they bet against these kinds of breakthroughs that they made no preparations for the advent of atomic weapons, none whatsoever. Um, and, uh, and so Zillard, in fact, um, realized immediately what the consequences would be. And he kept his, uh, his discovery secret and he patented a nuclear reactor that kept this patent secret. Um, the French patented a nuclear bomb 39 and they kept it secret. Um, <clears throat> but it was sort of too late, right? The cat, the cat did get out of the bag. The Germans also uh, were 
Germans, I think, were the first to demonstrate efficient reaction. So, um, so I think we were very lucky that uh, things turned out the way they did. So I think we need to prepare for the possibility of success in AI, that we'll have these AI systems that are able to make better decisions than us, not just on the chessboard and the go board, um, but out in the real world. And so, so that capability is what gives humans power over the world, right? It's what, what makes us the number one species and uh, all the other species basically uh, continue to exist only because we allow it. And um, so if we're creating systems that are in that sense more powerful than human beings, I think this is, this is the underlying sense of Turing's uh, comment is that uh, he doesn't see a way for us to retain power over more powerful entities forever. Um, and so that's the question that I think we have to answer. And I think one way to answer is to go back and say, you know, if, if making AI better and better makes things worse and worse, maybe we are doing the wrong thing in the first place, right? Um, and if you look at this definition, um, which is not just common, uh, it's not just part of AI, but I think control theory is the same definition, right? You're minimizing a cost functional. Uh, in statistics, you're minimizing a loss function in OR, you're <clears throat> maximizing a sum of rewards and economics, you're maximizing utility or social welfare and so on. Um, so this, this methodology is, it's very powerful, right? You create machinery that optimizes an objective, but you have to supply the objective to the machinery and then off it goes, right? Um, but in the real world, we can't specify the objectives completely and correctly. And you know, this is not a new observation, of course, right? I mean, it, it, economists have been talking forever about why GDP is a, a bad measure of of global welfare and so on and so forth. Um, and Norbert Wiener talked a lot about the fact that if you're going to put a, a as he put it, if, if you're going to put a purpose into a machine with whose operations you cannot effectively interfere, you better make sure the purpose is the one we really desire. Right? And, um, but over and over again, we see that we can't do that. Um, and this is, again, not a new observation, right? So the legend of King Midas he said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. That was this, his stated objective. He got exactly what he asked for. And then, of course, his food and his drink, and his family all turned to gold. Uh, and that's the end. Um, and the Sorcerer's Apprentice specifies uh, that the broom should fetch the water because he's too lazy, um, but he forgets to specify the exact amount. Uh, and he has to, <clears throat> then, then the, uh, the sorcerer has to come back and and turn off the brooms because he doesn't know how to turn them off. Um, and then if you, if you get three wishes from a genie, um, uh, my third wish would be, please can we fix audiovisual <laughs> equipment? So we have, uh, no, please undo the first two wishes, right? Because the, always those wishes end up backfiring uh, because they're misspecified and you made, made a mess of the universe. So, so I think this is the core of the problem um, and you can see that uh, we're already starting to suffer from this as AI. So we didn't suffer from it when AI was only in a lab, right? when we were only doing toy things, playing virtual chess on virtual chess boards. <clears throat> but um, when you look at social media, right, they're set up with the learning algorithms, the, the algorithms that choose what billions of people spend hours every day reading and watching. Um, and they're set up to maximize some objectives, so click-through or engagement um, or various other kinds of proxies. Um, and you might think, well, okay, if, if I want someone to click on something, I need to send them something that they're interested in. So, so I have to learn what people want. Well, that sounds good, right? That's sort of the you know, perfect example of economics at work, right? But this is not the optimal solution to maximizing click-through, right? The optimal 
solution to maximizing click-through is to modify people to be more predictable. Right? And this is what reinforcement learning algorithms do. Uh, they choose a sequence of actions to, uh, to change the state of the world, in, in this case, the state of your brain, uh, so that in future they get a higher stream of rewards. So for any given individual, they can learn <clears throat> how to best propagandize that person, how to brainwash them, uh, to change them into some other person who's going to be uh, a more voracious consumer of whatever material exists uh, when they're in that part of the political space, for example. Um, and I think there's, obviously the story is more complicated because there are, there's a lot of humans who are complicit in this uh, in terms of generating content and, uh, and so on. But this is, I think, basically what's going on uh, with social media. And I am hoping that we're actually going to be able to get access to the raw data to, uh, and to, to make randomized controlled trials to show that this is really happening. Um, and you can see that um, if the AI systems were better, right, these are really simple learning algorithms. They don't know that people have brains uh, or political opinions or anything, right? They're just uh, they're, they're treating a person as a, as a click sequence, right? Text of the article or, you know, descriptors of the video, uh, yes or no, did they click on it? Uh, and then a, a sequence of those. And that's all, that's all a human being is to these algorithms. Um, but if they were better at psychology and so on, then they'd be more effective at doing this. And, and they're already, I think, pretty effective, mainly because they can, they can nudge you, uh, you know, tens of thousands of times a month. Um, and only little nudges, but tens of thousands of little nudges can move you a long way psychologically. Um, so if we made the AI system better, right, the outcome would be much worse than it already is. So we need a different model, right? We need to get rid of this idea that to make an AI system, you write down an objective, you make some optimizing machinery, and you put the objective in, and off it goes. Um, so we're getting rid of that one, um, and I'm going to try this one instead, right? which is only a small change. Right? We just, uh, instead of their objectives, right, which are the things that we plug into them, we're insisting that what they do is beneficial for our objectives, namely what we want the future to be like. And those coincide if we're able to write down our objectives completely and correctly uh, and put them in the machine. Um, but all our experience tells us that that's not possible. Um, and so we're going to have to have machines that actually know that they don't know what the objective is. Right? So this, sounds, this problem sounds like, well, how can, they, how can they choose actions that achieve our objectives if they don't know what they are? Right? Uh, so it's, it sounds like I'm just setting up things to be un unsolvable, but actually it can be solved. Um, and uh, so I wrote three principles just, well, because Asimov wrote three principles. <laughs> um, but they are a little different, and it's interesting to see how they're different. Um, so the first goal is a little bit like Asimov's, you know, you can't harm humans, right? And, you know, sort of the complement of that. You have to satisfy human preferences. So preferences here means um, not what kind of pizza you like, but what future you prefer. In fact, what distribution over futures you prefer. So it's the full uh, preference structure that, you know, von Neumann posited uh, that you would have over all possible futures and all possible lotteries over all possible futures. Um, so it's a very, very large, complex thing that's not explicit in anybody. Um, and uh, that's, but that's what it has to do. And we'll talk a little bit more about the fact that there's obviously more than one human. Um, but the key point is that the robot does not know what those preferences are, right? And um, this turns out to be, I think, the key to how we actually uh, retain control over the machines forever. And then the third principle provides a way of connecting preferences 
and behavior. So it's sort of a grounding for what, what do we mean by human preferences. It's the things that drive human behavior. Um, and therefore, if you observe behavior, you can infer something about underlying preferences. Um, it's a complicated process because our behavior isn't a perfect reflection of our preferences. We are not perfectly rational. Uh, so it really, to do that inference, you have to understand something about human cognition. But you can turn this into a um, mathematical framework called an assistance game. Uh, so it's a game in the usual economic sense with at least one human and at least one robot participant. Um, and it's an assistance game because the, the robots are constituted to be of assistance to humans. Um, so the human has a payoff function. The robot's payoff function is the same as the human's, but the robot doesn't know what it is. Okay. Uh, and that, that basically gives, gives you those three principles. And when you solve those games, and you can literally write down these simple ones and solve them, look at the equilibrium solutions, um, you get what I think, at least qualitatively, you get what we want. Uh, we get that the, the robot defers to humans. Um, for example, it will ask permission if it, if it thinks that here's a possible plan, but the plan changes the world in some way whose value is unknown, then the robot has an incentive to ask permission so that it doesn't violate the unknown part of the human preferences. Um, and in the extreme case, it will allow itself to be switched off because it doesn't want to do whatever it is that the human wants to prevent it from doing. Right? It doesn't know what that is, but if the human wants to switch me off, it must have a reason. I, I will, I'm happy to have that happen. Right? And so we can show that it's rational for us to build machines that solve assistance games, um, because then they, they, they will be uh, expected net benefit to us. Um, and if you make the AI system better here, then it's better at understanding what our preferences are and better at satisfying those preferences. So, so things should get better rather than worse. So um, to make that concrete, right, to make it so, so that you understand what it's like to be the robot, right, I'm, I'm hoping this example will help. Uh, I found it useful. <laughs> so, so you're the robot, right? Your partner, husband, wife, whatever, is the human. Okay, and it's their birthday, and you have to buy them a birthday present, right? And you don't know what they want, right? And to, to factor out the money part, right, we'll have you buy it from the joint account, so, so that we don't have to worry too much about the, the trade off of quality for money. Um, but the point is here that your payoff in this game is exactly how happy your partner is going to be with the present. And the trouble is, you don't know, right? So, so this is what it's like to be the robot in the assistance game, okay? So now think about, well, what do you do? Right? Well, you could ask. You could, you know, leave pictures of watches or cars around the house <laughs> and see if they notice any of them and say, oh, that's a nice car or, you know, uh, uh, you know holiday brochures or you could ask their friends. Uh, there's all kinds of techniques we could use to try to infer um, something more about what they want for their birthday, right? Um, so this problem, of course, is unsolvable, as we know. But all, I think all the other all, all the other cases of, of assistance games, right? They, you know, the, there is a solution, and and it is at least computable. So that's good. So I'll just go through one example, um, which is the off switch problem, right? So, so how do we convince a robot to let us um, switch it off, right? So this is our PR2 in the lab, uh, Brett, the Berkeley robot for the elimination of tedious tasks. And um, he weighs about 450 pounds. So he, he's, uh, he has to have a safety off switch uh, on the back. Um, 
But if he was a normal robot with the classical objective, like, you know, fetch the coffee, right? Put that in as the goal that becomes his objective, right? And he's not, he doesn't have to be very bright to realize that you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. So now you've given Brett an incentive to disable his own off switch, right? Which is exactly what we want to avoid, right? We want to be able to turn it off. Um, so, and this is going to be true for pretty much any goal. But if we have uncertainty, if the robot has uncertainty about the objective, so it may, it may know that you want coffee, but be uncertain about lots of other things, um, it won't do that, right? And we can, we can set up a very simple formal model to illustrate uh, how this works. So, unfortunately, you can't see that. I don't know if I can move. Anyway, the robot is at the top. So okay. this is R uh, choosing. Um, initially, we're just going to give the robot two choices, right? So there's a, uh, a very attractive red button that says push me, right? This might start a nuclear war. It might okay. set off all the sprinklers in the building or the fire alarm. Right? Who knows what it does? Um, or the robot can just switch itself off. So this is committing suicide and we'll set arbitrarily just set the value of that to zero. Um, and the point is that this action here is potentially dangerous to humans, and the robot is uncertain about its values. So there's a horribility distribution over the value of the action. And at least in this picture, the mean of this distribution is slightly positive. So if this was the only two choices, the robot would just go ahead and push the big red button, right? So this is not giving a chance to the human to intervene, right? So this is sort of like disabling my off switch and plunging ahead, okay? But we're gonna give the robot a third choice, which is to allow the human to switch it off, right? So just say, wait, do nothing. Uh, and then the human can choose to switch the robot off, getting to the same state of value zero, right? Or the human can allow the robot to go ahead. So what's the point of doing that, right? The robot can already switch itself off and it could already do whatever he's gonna do here. So what does he gain by allowing the robot, uh, allowing the human to, to switch him off? Well, he gains information, right? Because if he's allowed to go ahead, um, then uh, it's because the human thinks that pushing the big red button is better than switching the robot off. Okay, so that quadrant disappears. And if you do a simple, right, this is exactly analogous to non-negative value of information, Right, the, the robot says, yeah, I have a positive incentive to allow myself to be switched off as long as I'm uncertain about the decision that the human is going to make. As soon as that uncertainty goes away, then um, uh, the incentive to allow yourself to be switched off goes away. Peter, yes. So we can, uh, we can allow for that. We, so in, in the paper, uh, the, it's called the off switch problem. Um, we allow for the human to be, for example, uh, Boltzmann rational. And as you turn up the degree of irrationality all the way up to being completely random, um, then you need a larger margin before the robot's going to allow this. And so you don't, if, if, you have a, if you're a self-driving car and you have a two-year-old in the back, Right? You don't want the two-year-old to switch the car off, right? But if it's, you know, if it's a competent adult, then maybe you do. So, so there are, um, you know, there's another case of, you know, what if the human is grumpy and doesn't want you to keep asking, uh, right? Then again, right, the, you need a larger margin before you'll ask the human for permission. Um, and the human pays for that, right? The grumpier they are, the more often the robot's going to do something that they're not, not completely happy with. It's really kind of the ratio of the human versus machine in, in that like in the limit is the machine has much, much better knowledge of the world than the human does. The machine might always think that, look, this human thinks X is the right path, but I've thought about this a lot more carefully. So, well, so there's two parts, right? There's, there's knowledge of the world and your ability to predict, but there's also knowledge of human preferences. Yeah. Right. So it, this, it's really uncertainty about preferences that Mm -hmm. um, right. so distinguishing it's, it's those. Key, yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, this may be a, a sort of a little bit of a special case, but 
but human preferences, I mean, one of the asked questions here is, you know, humans can be irrational. Um, humans have self-control problems. They say like, you know, please keep me from smoking more cigarettes mm -hmm. or, you know, tie me to the mast so I don't, you know, sail the ship into the um, uh, sirens. I mean, so I don't know if you want to consider those kinds of cases where the person's yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that when, when I get to the real human slide. Okay. Right. But for the time being, we're just Irrational. we're just thinking about you know an idealized human. Right. Yeah. These these are all. Yeah. I'm I'm sure many of you will have many questions, uh, and I will try to list most of them at the end. Okay. Um, okay. So um, yeah. So you can elaborate this in various ways by making the human a little bit less rational, a little bit more grumpy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the key, but the key thing remains here that there's sort of a direct mapping from uncertainty about human preferences to willingness to allow yourself to be switched off. Uh, and this is the only way I think we're going to do it. It's no good saying, well, yeah, okay, the robot doesn't want to be switched off, but we can outwit it. Right? I remember once I was called by a a film director who's making a new film about super intelligent AI. And he says, um, so he starts describing the plot and all this stuff. And he wants, he wants me to be a consultant to help him understand how the humans outwit the super intelligent AI. I said, sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> it's just, um, it's, it's not, you know, in the long run, it's not going to work that way. So, um, I'll just run very quickly through some of the, the questions, many of which will have occurred to you already. Um, so what do we do about many humans, right? We have the same social choice kinds of questions that uh, moral philosophers and economists have grappled with for thousands of years. Um, we're also going to have many machines, right? So there's probably will be billions of, uh, independent, possibly communicating, but you know, independently manufactured intelligent systems operating in the world. And even if they all conform to these design, uh, design rules, there's a question of whether they're going to have unfortunate strategic interactions with each other. Uh, and uh, so we're looking into those kinds of, of questions. Um, coming back to uh, humans who are not perfectly rational or grumpy, Right. Um, you know, a, a simple example would be Lee Sedol. Right. He's a brilliant Go player, but he played losing moves in that game with AlphaGo. Right. And we don't want AlphaGo to say, "Oh, I guess Lee Sedol must want to lose the game." That's weird. But you know, that's the only explanation for for him mm. making that losing move. No, of course, it's not the only explanation. Right. The explanation is he's not perfect. He has computational limitations. Uh, and so he played a move that he thought would win, but in fact lost. Um, and so if you're going to uh, infer preferences from behavior, you have to take into account actual cognitive capabilities. And that includes emotional uh, behaviors, you know, things you immediately regret, right? You, you don't want to take that as being um, definitive of human preferences. Uh, we also have to actually, if you look at the textbook, right, every chapter says, okay, well, you know, this is the definition of a Markov decision process, right? States, actions, rewards, transition model, right? You, so you've got to plug the reward in. The planning chapter has goals. The constraint satisfaction chapter has constraints, right? These are all definitions of objectives that have to be supplied up front to the algorithms. And we don't really have algorithms and complexity analysis and technology uh, that can accommodate uncertainty about objectives. So we have to redo all of this stuff um, and then produce demonstrations, prototype applications, showing how this approach actually uh, can work and actually produces better AI systems than uh, the classical method. Uh, so I'll briefly talk about some of the questions that arise with many humans. Um, so obviously the, there are you know nearly 8 billion of us and so system can learn you know, 8 billion preference models, uh, and that's fine, right? I mean, Facebook already has probably 3 billion preference models uh, in its database, and so 8 billion is not so much to ask. Um, and I think we'll find that, and this is, this is an entirely amateur uh, 
from domestication, but I think we'll find that there's a great deal of commonality in those preference structures, uh, you know, despite all the so-called, uh, you know, differences in uh, attitude between East and West and North and South and so on. Um, I think ultimately these are more differences in circumstance um, and what people want the future to be like is, is fairly similar, not identical, but fairly similar, which then helps a lot in uh, adapting to a new individual. You can have a reasonably strong prior um, for what, what kinds of things they're going to like. Um, and uh, the, you know, the, the key question, which is social choice theory, is how do you make these trade-offs uh, when you're making decisions that are going to affect more than one person? And um, in, in the book that I've written about this, Human Compatible, I sort of take as a, as a possible answer something like preference utilitarianism. Um, but there are a lot of still unanswered questions, even if you, uh, even if you take that uh, straightforward mathematical approach, which just says basically add them up, right? Treat everyone equally, add up their preferences, choose the, choose the policy that maximizes the, the sum of utilities of all the individuals. Um, so one objection uh, from Nozick is uh, that you can't make interpersonal comparisons of preferences. Um, and uh, Canaro also said this, this is an axiom at the beginning of his impossibility paper. There's no meaning to uh, interpersonal comparisons of preferences. So literally, you know, Jeff Bezos having to wait one microsecond longer for his private jet to arrive can't be compared with, you know, a woman in the Ukraine watching her family being uh, incinerated. Right? Does anyone believe that? <laughs> right? I don't even think Ken Arrow believes that, but that's the axiom in, in the paper. So uh, I, but I do think there is a non-trivial question because I have four children and I'm pretty sure they have different preference scales. Right? I think they maybe vary by a factor of 10 or so <laughs> in, the, in the sort of extent, you know, the sort of top to bottom scale um, that they have, but not by a million or a billion. Um, uh, so the preference utilitarianism theorems, right, the social aggregation theorems uh, typically assume individuals with common beliefs. Um, and we'll see that uh, with different beliefs, you get quite different answers for social aggregation. Um, since the late 19th century, people have, have asked, well, what about decisions that, uh, that change who exists? And then what, what are you comparing, right? Um, and uh, so Thanos, if, if you've seen the movie, um, this is Thanos, right? So he collects these infinity stones and that gives him the power to implement his policy, uh, which is that if you got rid of half the people in the universe, the other half would be more than twice as happy. So he does his little utilitarian calculations as, yeah, I've got it, you know, and he's completely at peace with his decision to get rid of half the people in the universe. Um, so we don't necessarily, I mean, I, that might be the right answer, but we don't want AI systems making that decision yet. Uh, and soon, we don't know when exactly, but at some point they will have sort of Thanos levels of power. Uh, and we have to answer these philosophical questions before that, right? And we have done these things in the past, right? This Chinese one child policy horribly got rid of 500 million people, right? So like more than 10 times the number who died in World War II. Uh, was that a good decision or a bad decision? Well, I, I don't think we know yet. Uh, we don't know an answer to that question. Um, so uh, then there are complications when uh, we introduce things uh, in the fact that people's preferences include the well-being of others. Uh, some of us are altruists, some of us are sadists. Uh, and then there's relative preferences, um, so positional goods, as economists call them, uh, which mathematically operate the same way as sadism, right, in the sense that, uh, you know, what if uh, I'm happy if I have a bigger, shinier car than you do, which is true whether I make my car bigger and shinier or I make your car smaller and dirtier, right? Um, and so, uh, so you get this... Uh, 
this dynamic that's very similar to the pure sadism, sadism which most preference utilitarians rule out. So ruling out relative preferences uh, is a much bigger thing to do. Okay, so just, well, okay, we're really running out of time. Very quickly. Um, so I mentioned this idea that um, when we aggregate human preferences, right, the, the social aggregation theorem from Hassani says every Pareto optimal policy uh, optimizes a linear combination of preferences. And then he sends up by symmetry, it should be just uh, you know, everyone should have weight one in that linear combination. Um, but for this to be true, you need to assume that all the people have the same belief about the future. And if you, um, if you take away that, uh, that assumption, so now people can have different beliefs about the future, which is a much more reasonable assumption, um, then the Pareto optimal policies no longer look like aggregation, at least static aggregation. They change the uh, the weights in the allocation according to whose predictions turn out to be right. Okay, so exactly proportional to the likelihood that your prior accords to the observed data uh, as the world unfolds. Right? So you can see that the, the weights would actually end up exponentially different uh, in a fairly, short, small, fairly small amount of time. Right? Um, so this is a very weird theorem. Um, but it's true simply because uh, everyone thinks that their beliefs are the right beliefs, otherwise they would change them, right? Um, so everyone thinks they're gonna win this game and they want, they want to win this game because they get more in this game than they would in the static game. So everyone likes this and so they won't allow any kind of static policy, they'll do this one instead. Um, so I don't know what to think about that. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip, just very briefly mention, okay, to deal with the, the millions of robots, we need some kind of open source game theory where, where algorithms can expect, inspect each other's source code or inspect proofs about the source code uh, in order to then deduce what the equilibrium is going to be in their interaction. And actually, typically, if things go well, they can cooperate uh, immediately without any, any kind of uh, acculturation process between the robots. Um, and then real humans, we already talked about some of these issues, computational limitations, emotional behavior. Um, preferences for autonomy are really interesting, right? One way of thinking about autonomy is I want, I want to be free to do something that is not in my own best interest, right? So that means that the robots, to respect autonomy, have got to allow us to do things that are not in our best interests. So it's like, we don't, we don't want them to just keep us on the freeway and close all the off-ramps, right? Um, so in some sense, they have to stop predicting what it is that uh, we're going to do. Um, so it's, you get some interesting self-referential kind of optimization problems. Plasticity is the biggest problem with this approach in general, and I think with all kinds of uh, approaches based on rationality, is, is the fact that our preferences can be changed by external factors. Um, and that presents a question of who is the AI optimizing for you today or you tomorrow? Um, how do we make sure they don't manipulate our preferences? Um, and as, as Amartya Sen pointed out, right, a lot of our preferences are there because someone else wants us to have those preferences. Uh, particularly those in power want us to have preferences that, uh, that keep them in power uh, and keep you in your place. And uh, so those preferences may not be ones that the AI system should take at face value. Uh, if you're interested, there's an, uh, a non-technical book, um, Human Compatible, and then the fourth edition of the AI textbook has some of the technical stuff, although it's still uh, mostly the previous version of AI, the, uh, the AI with fixed objectives. So to summarize, um, I think uh, if we succeed, the upside is enormous, but if we succeed within the standard model, uh, I think we're going to get the downside, which is uh, disastrous. Um, and I think if we change the way we think about AI, maybe we can get the best of both worlds. Uh, and this kind of AI would actually be, it's not just a matter of like it's safer or anything like that, it's just better. 
like this is the AI that we want to have. Um, it'll be more adaptable, more flexible, more useful to us, uh, as well as being safer. Um, so I think the economics should drive us in this direction. And we should stop thinking of this as a battle between the ethicists and the AI researchers, where the ethicists wag their fingers and the AI researchers say, go away and leave me alone, yeah. right? It should be that when an AI researcher gets up in the morning, this is what they mean by doing AI, right? Just as when a doctor gets up in the morning, they, they say, okay, I'm gonna heal some people today, right? They don't have an ethical battle within themselves about that. At least I hope they don't, right? So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, that was incredibly uh, provocative and interesting. I, I have a ton of questions. I know everyone here and, and online have a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time, so we're going to have to uh, Sorry point that. you to your, your books and others for, for, to dive in deeper on that. I'll just let uh, people know that uh, next week our speaker is going to be Marshall Van Alstein of BU. He's going to be talking about free speech platforms and the fake news problem. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks very much. Thanks. Love your work. Terrific stuff. Yeah.